I mean, even we call them species sometimes with wolves and foxes and coyotes and domestic dogs. They're all interfertile. They're all part of the dog kind. But variety is possible. Adaptation is possible. But changing into a different kind doesn't happen. Has never been seen. And what we see is that it doesn't happen. <laughs> Sometimes change is dramatic. But these, these two dogs are part of the dog kind. They are interfertile. They are dogs. Dogs is dogs and cats is not cats. I mean, cats is not dogs and, and dogs and cats are different. If we're thinking about the creation model, we can summarize it in two main scientific points. There's the biblical creation model. The scientific creation model really depends on these two points. Sudden appearance. Dogs got here suddenly without having descended from a non-dog ancestor. Got it? A sudden appearance and then stasis. That's a Greek word for staying the same, stationary, static. It means you stay dogs. Once they got here, they stay dogs. They might have varied, but they still dogs. They're either still dogs or they're extinct. They did not evolve into something else. Sudden appearance and stasis. The creation model talks about the six days of creation. You remember the story. Your kids went to Awanas, right? Day one, God creates the heavens and the earth and then forms light. Day two, the oceans and the atmosphere. Day three, the continents were formed and, and plants growing on the continents. Day four, the sun and the moon and the stars. Notice that the stars came long after the earth, or three days after the earth. Not 15 billion years before the earth. Day five, the animal life in the oceans... The oceans are just teeming with life. And then the animals that fly, all the flying creatures. Day six, the land-based creatures. And then God created the image of God in man, male and female, on day six. And that's everything in those six days of creation. Well, some people say, well, that word day might mean an indefinite period of time, millions and billions of years, and can be equated then with the Billions of years of geologic time. Well, I don't think so, because right there in Genesis 1, in verse 3 through 5, the first time the word day is used, the, word, the Hebrew word day is the Hebrew word yom. It can sometimes be translated as an indefinite period. But um, it normally is translated as a day, uh, like today. But um, the first time God uses it, he defines it. On day one, God creates light. And divides the light from the darkness. And the light he called day, that's our word, and the darkness he called night. He defined his term and then he used it throughout the rest of the chapter. Did this on day one, did that on day two, did that on day three. You def he defined his term so he couldn't get it wrong. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians, a lot of Christian leaders, a lot of seminary professors, a lot of Bible college professors... A lot of preachers just get this wrong. They say, oh no, Carl Sagan has proven that the earth is billions of years old. Therefore, I've got to fit that into Scripture. Maybe the days were billions of years long. Dear friends, I am sick and tired of having Carl Sagan tell Christians how to interpret Scripture. Amen. Let Scripture interpret itself. Amen. That word yom is, is quite common in the Old Testament. Uh, it's the word day, and in almost every case, it's used in the Old Testament outside of Genesis 1 uh, in over a couple thousand times. And in almost every case, it means a day like today. Um, there are a few places where it says the day of the Lord. There's one, I think, it says in the days of Abraham. And that's a period of time, I guess. But uh, in, in the great majority of cases, it's a day like today. And whenever it's used in the plural, like three days or 40 days... 40 days fast or a three days journey, it always means, without exception, a literal day. Genesis 1 is not the exception. Um, it means a literal day. And then in Genesis 1, it's modified by the terms evening and morning, where the first day and the second day and the third day. That word is modified by evening and morning, or evening or morning, uh, quite a number of times in the Old Testament. And in every case, it's always a real day. And you can tell it from the context. And <coughs> whenever it's modified by a number, like first day, second day, third day, or 40 days, or, it always means a literal day. There is no exception. 
I think scripture is clear. God is saying he created in six days like today. And that's what he says. And that's what we need to believe. I think the lid is nailed on the coffin in the book of Exodus, the very next book in the Bible, where the people of Israel were in captivity and they exited Egypt. God led them out of Egypt and they went to Mount Sinai where God gave them some information that he really wanted them to have. It was so important to God that he wrote it in stone. Now, I'm a geologist. I like stone, okay? So I like this passage. He wrote it in stone. That's where we get our expression. And in that stony passage, one of those Ten Commandments has to do with worship on the Sabbath day. That's our Hebrew word, yom. And then he goes on to describe that it says, you work six days and rest one day. And then in verse 11, God gives the reason right there in the rock. It says, you work six days and rest one day because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that lives in them. And he rested the seventh day. How could anything be more plain? I work six days and rested one day, therefore you work six days and rest one day. And in those six days I created everything. If we're going to call ourselves Bible believers, I think we've got to believe, especially what's written in stone. <laughs> Evolution... We hear the, the phrase, evolution by mutation and natural selection. I want you to underline that word natural. That's an important word, natural selection. Uh, evolution by natural processes, by natural law. Evolution is just something that, according to evolutionists, just naturally happened. It required no supernatural. Got it? We're talking natural here. I really think evolution is the religion of naturalism, that there is no supernatural at work on planet Earth. This is a worldview. It is a religion, the anti-Christian religion. It is the religion that natural processes have done it all, including natural selection. Let me amplify it. Remember, science has to do with observation. That's what scientists do. They make their observations. They do their experiments. They collect their data. That's what scientists do is make observations. But when we're talking evolution and creation, we can't observe them. If they happened at all, they happened in the unobserved past when nobody was watching. Because they're not happening today. We can't see creation happen. But I've got to tell you, no evolutionist will even claim that they have ever seen evolution take place. They say it happened in the past when I wasn't watching. Well, we say the same thing. Both of these are worldviews about unobserved history. This is not strict science here. It's a philosophy about the past. A worldview about the past. Trying to explain the fact that you and I are here and are what we are without a supernatural God. That's the reason Darwin thought it up, because he had given up on God. I've got to get here somewhere. Only natural law is what we've got to work with, and natural selection was his best guess. But evolution doesn't fit the scientific evidence very well. But uh, they're both views about unobserved history. Mm. We don't observe evolution or creation happening in the present. We do see mutation. Now, that happens all the time. In fact, all of you have mutated some since you've been sitting here. You are all mutants, okay? Thankfully, your cells are so well designed, they find those mutations and fix them before they can do any damage. But um, we do see mutations, but they're not innovative. They're not helpful. We do see survival of the fittest. But uh, that's kind of a totalitous thing. I mean, the fittest survive, therefore, the survive. Yeah. But these are impotent to bring about true evolutionary change. To go from a frog to a prince, you need a lot of really helpful mutations. But mutations, they are overwhelmingly harmful, not helpful and innovative. They are what we call birth defects when they get into the reproductive cells. That's a birth defect. 
And evolutionists say that trillions of helpful birth defects have turned that frog into a prince. And you know, we have never observed one helpful birth defect. We, we, you could count them on the fingers of one hand, even if you're a mutant and don't have any fingers. <laughs> Beneficial mutations, that's a contradiction in terms. It does not happen. These are harmful, not helpful. Evolution goes uphill. What we see is going downhill. We do see survival of the fittest. That's not really natural selection. Uh, did you know that evolutionists don't even claim to have seen natural selection take place? They ascribe everything to natural selection. Natural selection is almost a god, can do everything, can turn a frog into a prince. But we don't see it really working. Uh, there's nothing selecting about natural selection. I mean, selection means you've got to think through it, through it and make your choice. But biblically, what's really happening is that the organism itself was created with these marvelous powers to adapt, to vary, and to adapt it so they can survive. Uh, God has built that into the organisms, not into nature doing the selection. The organism itself varies in order to survive. It's just the wrong way of thinking about things. We do not observe vertical change. Evolution is vertical change, but we do not observe it. What we do observe is stasis. We do observe things staying the same. Evolution is all about changes. But what we observe as scientists is stasis. We have never seen anything other than stasis. We've seen some downhill slides. We have seen some extinctions, but we've never seen anything new come into existence. We've never seen anything climb a hill. It always goes downhill. Evolution didn't happen. Christians ought not to believe in evolution because it just didn't happen. And Christians ought to believe in true things. Evolution doesn't happen in the present. They say, oh, well, it maybe it happened in the past when we weren't watching well, we do have a record of life in the past, and that's in the fossil record. Let me show you a little bit about the fossil record. The fossils, in the, one of the lowest levels of the geologic strata, the oldest levels, 500 million years ago, according to evolution. I, I don't buy the number. Don't get hung up about the number. I think that's a wrong number. But according to them, 500 million, 550 million years ago, this creature lived... And it's a trilobite. It's a very common fossil. Evolution says you go from simple to complex. Amoeba to man, right? I mean, you've heard this. I mean, it's simple to complex. But I've got to tell you, these ones on here at the bottom, which are supposed to be the oldest, they're complex. I mean, they are complex. I mean, this creature, this trilobite, is as complex as any creature around today. Life started out complex. It's still complex. There's no such thing as simple life. If it's living, it's complex. If it's simple, it can't live. There's no such thing as simple life. Life has always been complex. This trilobite, oh, you should see, sometimes in the fossils, you can even see the eyeball. Uh, here's a picture of the eyeball. That's called a complex lens. That is as complex as any eyeball that's around today. Things started out complex, they stayed complex, they're still complex. There's no such thing in the fossil record as simple to complex. You have been watching a presentation by Dr. John Morris, who is the president of the Institute for Creation Research. His presentation contained a very insightful review of the fossil record, a section we do not have the time to include in this program. However, you can get a video copy of Dr. Morris's complete presentation in this album entitled Christianity Under Attack. The album contains three DVDs that in turn contain all six of the presentations that were made at our 2011 Bible Conference. Each presentation runs approximately 50 minutes in length, so this album contains 300 minutes of fully illustrated presentations by six different speakers on the following topics. The Challenge of Islam, The Challenge of Government, the challenge of apostasy, the challenge of evolution, the challenge of humanism, and
The Promise of Victory. You can get the album for a gift of $25 or more plus the cost of shipping. Just call the number you see on the screen and ask for the album by name, Christianity Under Attack. Call Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. You can also request the album through our website at www.lamblion.com. As we bring our program to a close, let me share with you one other brief segment from Dr. Morris's presentation. In it, he compares evolution with creationism and demonstrates their basic incompatibility. This is a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian because the evidence is on our side. Got it? Well, evolution as a way of thinking is, let, let me summarize the evolution model. We're talking about the dangers of evolution. Evolution has the idea that natural, things got here by natural processes. And whatever those natural processes were, they are continuing. Uh, evolution is thought to be going on now, except it's going too slow to see. Um, so that's point one, continue. The United States of America was founded upon Christian principles, and throughout the history of our nation, our Christian heritage has been respected by our government officials until the middle of the 20th century. Since that time, Christianity has come under increasing attack from government officials at all levels, but particularly from those in our national government. To put this trend in perspective from the viewpoint of an expert on the subject, please stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Last week, we began broadcasting a new series of programs drawn from presentations made during our 2011 Bible Conference, the theme of which was Christianity Under Attack. In our program last week, we focused on the challenge of Islam. This week, our topic is the challenge of government, and our presenter is none other than Dr. Frank Reich, the esteemed president of the National Religious Broadcasters, whose offices are located in the Washington, D.C. area. This man and his staff operate daily in the halls of Congress where they are waging a war to protect the rights of Christians against government intrusion. Here now is Dr. Wright. It's great to be here with you uh, to enjoy these cool North Texas breezes. <laughs> I'm telling you, my car said 98 degrees the whole way over here last night, so it is hot here. Which reminds me of how cold it was in Washington, D.C. this past winter. I, we don't normally get terribly cold winters, but it was, an, it was an exceedingly cold winter. So much so that all the high-priced lawyers and attorneys in Washington, D.C. actually kept their hands in their own pockets for a change. So it was... Uh, I'm going to attempt to do something that I hope will be beneficial for all of us. It has been for me as I've considered this and studied this. I'm not come, I've not come to give you a report about what's going on in Washington, D.C. so much. I'll touch on a couple of legislative items at the end that I think bear on our ability to freely proclaim the gospel of Christ. But uh, it was Winston Churchill who once said, the farther you look back, the farther forward you can see. In other words, history is prologue to what's coming next. And I believe that we live in a day when we must look back to clearly see what lies ahead, especially as it relates to the halls of the corridors of power, uh, which in Washington, D.C., makes up the three branches of government, the executive branch, the president, the Congress, and the courts. And all three of those branches today are impinging dramatically on our religious freedoms. I think it's important that we look back because, in my opinion, the days ahead for us, and I'm no Jeremiah, I'm not here to deliver a, a Jeremiah ad, a wringing our hands in fear and trembling. I'm not of that camp. But I believe the days ahead are fraught with danger. And the greatest danger may be that if we sit on our hands and do nothing. 
But there are other dangers as well that I want to speak to some of those. I, I think you could argue that we live in the most significantly or a time significantly fraught with peril, perhaps more than any other time since the founding of our country. And yet with that danger, I think we see the seeds of opportunity as well. I'm persuaded that in order to advance truth, which is what we're really all about, isn't it? You know, Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate and he said, Pilate said, so you're a king. And he said, for this reason was I born and for this reason have I come into the world. What? Jesus is telling you the very reason he was born, the very reason he came into the world. What did he say? For this reason was I born. For this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. And the mission of Christian broadcasters, the mission of the church of Jesus Christ is to advance truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I'm persuaded that in order to advance truth, we have to have a healthy respect and understanding for its foes, for those who oppose truth. As someone who I've known for many years in Washington, D.C., once said, It's good to read the Bible every day to know what God is thinking. And it's good to read the Washington Post just to get the opposing viewpoint. (laughs) We we that's not really very charitable, is it, to our friends at the Washington Post? uh, But the principle is a good one. We need to know how our how the opponents of truth respond to our message in order to to do a better job of proclaiming our message. If we aim to proclaim truth, we must carefully study how our adversaries opponent. In my years of working on Capitol Hill, I've observed a standardized approach used by many who contend with us in the marketplace of ideas. It's a predictable methodology that I see unfold almost every day of the week. It's what I call the politics of opposition, the politics of opposition. In this seven-point framework that I'm going to give you, you will see the principal way that ideas are opposed in political, legal, legislative arenas, but also just in the marketplace of ideas, the very place that we're trying to advance the gospel of Christ. More than that, you'll see that I think the principal way that truth is opposed in almost every form you can imagine. I want to walk you through the seven stages quickly, through the seven stages of the politics of opposition, then I want to apply them to our battle to bring the gospel and the mind of Christ into the culture. That's what's needed, isn't it? To proclaim Christ, but also to bring the mind of Christ to the institutions of our culture. Uh, It was Abraham Kuyper who, who, who said that only Jesus can say there's not one inch of all creation that Christ cannot say, mine. It's all his. He is sovereign. He's sovereign over the church. He's sovereign over the culture. He's sovereign over government, business, law, education. All of it is submissive or should be and one day will be to the sovereign reign of the King of Kings. Let me begin by uh, also as we walk through this. Try, I want to apply these things then to our effort to advance the gospel and the culture and the opposition that we see there. I want you to keep in mind as I begin that I'm speaking primarily about a strategy, about a plan of opposition. It's not just some random thing that happens. And uh, it's employed by those who stand in opposition to public policy questions and also values and ethics and truth itself. The first step in the politics of opposition is a simple one. It's quite simply to just ignore your viewpoint. They won't even uh, condescend to. acknowledge your idea. In fact, they believe that the very act of acknowledging you would give your position more recognition than it deserves. And so you are summarily and rather haughtily dismissed. We see atheists do that principally as it relates to believers, dismissing them altogether, not even willing to entertain their ideas. Step two is to marginalize your opinion by characterizing it as being out of the mainstream. How many times in Washington, D.C. have I heard the word mainstream? And boy, as far as I can tell, that stream flows pretty far to the left in Washington, D.C. It's not down the middle. 
Here your opponents will do something different than ignore you. They sort of shake their heads uh, by saying and uh, by saying that only those on the fringes of the debate hold the opinion that you hold. In other words, you're you are way out there on the margin and not uh, worthy to be uh, really even recognized. And so they just label you as a fringe type of a person. And accompanied by the appropriate winks and nods and sort of condescending looks, they say, well, these people are just a little extreme. That's what you all are. Do you know that you're extremists? And, you know, he was condemned for saying it, but I love Goldwater's comment all those years ago in which he said extremism in pursuit of virtue is no vice. Extremism in pursuit of truth is no vice. The third step in the, in the politics of opposition is having tried to ignore you, having tried to marginalize you, they will then attack the factual basis of your opinion. You got your facts all wrong. Recognizing that they can no longer ignore you or marginalize you, they will begin to contend with you. However, they will not contend over the perspective you're advancing, but over the foundation on which it rests. And so they're going to say uh, to themselves, if we can destroy, destroy or discredit the factual foundation, then your viewpoint that you're trying to advance goes along with it. In this way, your antagonists, antagonists hope to uh, argue that your stance is not worth, worth considering because it's just factually way off base. It's not worthy of consideration. So step one is to ignore. Step two is to marginalize. And step three is to attack the factual basis of your idea. But when the efforts to undermine your factual basis uh, begin to fail, they begin to challenge you in a different way. By dismissing you, by dismissing your idea as though the debate over it is over. It's been resolved and you're on the losing side. With a wave of their hand, they invoke that favorite mantra. The debate is over in this matter, don't you know? Here's some of the other words they'll use to accompany this dismissal. History has shown, experts agree, choose your experts, it's now beyond dispute. This matter has been long settled. That's the rhetoric of dismissal. These things that you bring forward... They are from old, and they have been dismissed and discredited a very long time ago. They attempt to dismiss your ideas. The not too subtle point being that you are a member of the latter-day Flat Earth Society, and that your ideas are so out of touch and have long been discredited that we can ignore them. Well, having declared the debate over and yet still seeing your persistent efforts to advance truth in the marketplace of ideas, your foes will eventually draw the next arrow from their quiver. And here begin the ad hominem attacks. Ad hominem meaning against the man. The personal attacks. You've brought your ideas forward. They've attempted to ignore them, to marginalize them, to attack the factual basis, to dismiss the ideas, the debate being over. Now they're coming after you. Now these personal attacks are shaped like this initially. No serious person believes that. All reasonable people agree. Reputable experts are of the same opinion. You get the flavor of that. What they mean by that is you're not a person to be taken seriously. You're not a reasonable person. In fact, you're a little disreputable. Well, we're all in that class, aren't we? In the class of the disreputable according to the eyes of the unbelieving world. By the way, these attacks generally begin with sort of a rhetorical flair, using the kind of phrases that that I just used, but they quickly descend into rank name-calling. Casting aspersions on your character and your integrity, even pelting you with epithets. And so much for their, you know, their greatest mantra, of course, is tolerance, but they, they, uh, they have very little tolerance for us. Some of our other speakers here at this conference can testify in detail as to the mean-spirited nature of these attacks once they begin. And these attacks are all designed to accomplish one thing, to divert attention from your viewpoint to you. They realize they're losing ground on the idea you're advancing, and so they're trying to undermine your personal credibility. But then these ad hominem attacks are followed by something far more ominous, and I believe that's exactly where we are today. The next step in the politics of opposition is to restrict your ability to advance your viewpoint. 
So a dramatic example of this comes from the world of broadcasting. It's the so-called fairness doctrine, which I won't go into a lot of detail about it, except to say that the government in days past looked at the limited spectrum available for broadcast and said, you know, we have a compelling government interest to ensure that every viewpoint is heard. And so the fairness doctrine is kind of an equal time requirement that if you advocated on a position of substantial public importance, an idea that was deemed to be controversial, you had to make equal time available for an opposing viewpoint. That doctrine reigned in radio and television for 30 or 40 years, and it was repealed, but there have been repeated attempts to bring it back. And even though it's sort of struggling in our day because its opponents have been successful in labeling it a policy not, not worthy of support in light of our free speech protections, it still seems to rear its ugly head over and over again. By the way, I hope you can hear the, pro the two problems with the Fairness Doctrine. First is, on matters of substantial public importance, and then if you bring a controversial viewpoint, who makes this determination as to which matters are of substantial public importance? The government. Who decides that your viewpoint is controversial? The government. And so you have the government so controlling the marketplace of ideas that your viewpoint is restricted because you have to give up half your time to, to make uh, opposing viewpoints heard as well. Now, I will say that back in the day of limited uh, spectrum, uh, what the, you know, the FCC calls uh, spectrum scarcity, this might have been a reasonable public policy at one point. But today, with radio and television, satellite and wireless and cable, and all the means of dis distributing content electronically, you cannot argue that there is spectrum scarcity, nor can you argue that there's a viewpoint that's not being heard because of it. And so the Fairness Doctrine has been widely discredited, but you need to understand what it is at its essence. It's an, op it's an effort to restrict your ability to proclaim the things that you believe are true. It's declaring Christianity to be controversial. And having made that declaration... Who is not waiting in line from the ranks of Islam or Eastern mysticism or rank paganism to say, I have an opposing viewpoint. I'd like to bring my opposing viewpoint. And by the way, which doctrine of the Christian church is not controversial anyway? Might that be the deity of Jesus Christ? No, everybody agrees on that. Oh, wait a minute. No, they don't. How about the resurrection? How about the virgin birth? Pick any Christian doctrine you can think of. And someone's going to say, I find that to be controversial and I demand equal time. So you see what they're trying to do is squelch you. It's an effort to restrict your ability, to constrain your ability to speak truth into the marketplace of ideas. And finally, uh, in our steps, uh, seven steps into politics of opposition, efforts to constrain your freedom to express your ideas are followed closely by an aggressive effort to legally prohibit them. And that is what stands immediately in front of us in our generation. Here, the force of law is applied to stop you and give warning to others who might be of like mind to you. And uh, the recently enacted hate crimes legislation is the very tool that they will use to accomplish to that end. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So let me re recapitulate here, if I might. The seven steps in the politics of opposition are first, you are ignored, then you are marginalized, then the veracity of your arguments, the factual basis is challenged, then you are attacked personally, not your veracity, but your integrity, then you are restricted in your ability to advance your ideas, then you are prohibited from prohibiting, uh, promoting the ideas you hold as truth. You are watching Dr. Frank Wright, president of the National Religious Broadcasters. He is speaking on the challenge that our national government presents to Christianity today. He's been talking about how government attempts to marginalize those with whom it disagrees. As we continue with his presentation, he will illustrate how these techniques are being applied to Christianity today. Well, what lessons can we learn from this system of opposition that I've seen over and over again a thousand times? Uh, what can we learn in terms of uh, our mission to advance truth and to bring the mind of Christ to the culture? Well, first is 
Step one in the politics of opposition is not all that bad of a thing. When they ignore you, when you can fly a little bit under the radar screen, you can accomplish a great deal. When you are engaged in cultural reformation, in fact, it may not be a great idea to hold up a flag and wave it in front of your enemy and tell him what you're doing. It might be a good idea to go about the business of proclaiming truth and attempting to transform the culture without so much fanfare. Second, remember that attempts to marginalize your viewpoint are really a sign of weakness uh, on their part. And it really is a platform for response from you. When they try to say your views are out of the mainstream, it's an opportunity to respond. We could all learn from a technique that I learned from Dr. Kennedy many years ago that he called the judo technique. You know, in martial arts, all forms of martial arts, judo uh, as an example of it, Typically, what's done is you, you attempt to use the force of your opponent's blow, throw them off balance and use that energy, use that force against them to, uh, to you know, to to defeat them. And uh, Dr. Kennedy used to talk about using the judo technique, using the force of your opponent's blow and turning it against them. So when he said when someone attempts to assign you to the fringes of the debate, you respond by saying, I'm glad you said that. My viewpoint is not widely held because that reveals to me you don't even understand the foundation of what I'm trying to say. Let me stop for a moment and explain to you what our viewpoint really is, and then you might be able to make a decision about whether you want to oppose it or not. So you take, because when someone comes at you and says your viewpoint is fringe, what is the motivation that's driving them? It's their pride. It's their pride, and they act condescendingly as though they understand Christian truth, in which they don't. And so you can turn that against them and uh, make your case as persuasively as possible, having disarmed your opponent. In this way, what is essentially, let's, let's be honest with it, when you try to dismiss somebody as being a uh, fringe on the fringe of an argument, that's nothing more than a high school debate team tactic. It's easily overcome as long as you can, can forcefully proclaim truth. Third, let me say, remember that the attacks against the factual basis of your viewpoint are also an opportunity to speak truth and to speak truth to a culture that doesn't believe in truth. I want, I want you to miss this point. The culture out there today says we don't believe in truth. We don't believe truth even exists. But when you argue for the factual basis of what you believe and they say that factual basis is false, in the world of logic, they're arguing that the, yours is false, something else is true. They're arguing that they do, in fact, believe in truth. So they're really undermining their own position when they do that. But the very argument that your viewpoint is not true, therefore, presupposes another viewpoint that is. And this is an important advantage. And then fourth, when someone declares the debate to be over, recognize that you have won an important victory. We saw this, I think, in... Uh, in a lot of ways, certainly in the global warming debate, when Al Gore stood up and said, listen, the debate is over, you knew for sure it was not over. <laughs> when anybody says the debate is over, you can be sure that it's not. It means that they are trying to uh, get away from the strength of your argumentation and trying to declare it something you know, beyond debate. And then fifth, we need to recognize that the onset of ad hominem attacks is the first sign that the opposition has become fearful of the strength of your arguments. When they begin to attack you, it's a sign that they recognize the strength of your argument and are, are becoming somewhat desperate in their efforts to restrict it. This is a signal that they're fearful of your ideas and they must strike at your personal credibility in order to under undermine it. I don't know, how, some of you are here or are, are, uh, have been around long enough to remember the Clinton days and poor Paula White and the accusations that she made against former President Clinton. And uh, here lies a good example of this uh, ad hominem kind of approach. It wasn't until Paula White's assertions became more credible and could no longer be ignored that the ad hominem attacks began, that the Clinton, what they used to call the Clinton attack machine, went into action. And it was then that James Carville went on national television and essentially called Paula White trailer park trash. Shameful, shameful, but reflective of the fact that they couldn't argue against the facts any longer and had to attack this poor woman who was standing against the most powerful man in the world. 
Six, we need to recognize that attempts to even restrict the prohibition to advance your ideas signal the onset of full combat. The onset of full combat. I want to come back to that because we can't just deal with all this intellectually. We are now at the, repl- at the place where all of these things are going to demand from the people of God a response. Are you aware of the fact that one of the greatest challenges to Christianity in the world today is humanism? It is eroding Christianity both from within and without. What is humanism? How can you recognize it? How should Christians respond to it? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy. Showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Over the past few weeks, we have been sharing with you some excerpts from the presentations that were made at our 2011 Bible Conference, whose theme was Christianity Under Attack. We have thus far considered the challenge of Islam, the challenge of government, the challenge of apostasy, and the challenge of evolution. In this program, we're going to focus on the challenge of humanism, and our speaker is going to be Dr. Ron Rhodes, the founder and director of a ministry called Reasoning from the Scriptures. Thank you. Is anybody here excited about Jesus? Yeah. All right. How about, uh, how about the Bible? Are you excited about the Bible? Anybody here standing on the promises of God? You guys are a bunch of fanatics. Just my kind of people. You know, some people are talking about turning your cell phones off. Well, I have a good friend who was doing a, a live television show about the resurrection, and guess what happened? His cell phone went off right in the middle of the live TV show. But you know what the ringtone was? Mission Impossible. <laughs> Lord has a sense of humor. I could picture Jesus turning to the Father and said, Watch this. This is going to be good. <laughs> but today, I'm going to talk about something a little more serious, which is the challenge of humanism and atheism. And uh, i got to tell you, I do believe that Christianity is in the crosshairs today. Today, Christianity is under attack, and I believe that humanists and atheists are on the front lines. In fact, I can tell you that they seek to want to erase Christianity from our culture today. Uh, What are the targets? Well, the targets would include, for example, Christian holidays like Easter and Christmas, uh, nativity scenes. Uh, I know that you've seen lawsuits launched against businesses because they got a nativity scene out front. Christian morality is under attack. The Christian Bible is under attack. In fact, uh, humanists and atheists say that it's a vile book full of ethical barbarisms. It's an ancient book written by superstitious men, and it wasn't even true back in biblical times. I mean, it's a false book. Uh, Christian crosses or crucifixes are under attack. And as well, Christians are under attack in terms of the influence that they want to express in schools and education and government, and public policy, and Hollywood, and the government, and media, and much more. You see, the humanists want to marginalize Christians. They want to make Christians irrelevant in the current dialogue and debate. In the process, I believe that there have been many denials of Christian freedoms, uh, especially at the workplace. I'm thinking about a, a Christian apartment owner that I read about, and this Christian apartment owner was actually prosecuted for refusing to rent an apartment to an unmarried couple. Now, this person owned the apartment building, and this is a person of virtue. Uh, This Christian wanted to make sure that the people who lived in the apartment building had a clean life and were reasonably responsible people. But he was prosecuted because he refused to rent it to an unmarried couple. Just put it a little more strongly. He was prosecuted for not allowing a couple to go in there and commit fornication within the walls of the building that he himself owns. Christian freedoms are under attack. I'm thinking about the sixth grade elementary school girl who gave an oral report on the Bible. Now, you know, sixth graders can be excited about things, right? 
so she brought some extra copies of her book report. And any student who wanted it, she gave a copy out right after the classroom. Well, shortly after, a teacher barged in and escorted this young girl to the principal's office, and she was interrogated by school officials and denied the right to call her mother. Now, do you think that she's remembered that ever since that happened? And do you think she's going to remember that her entire life? I think that she is. My friends, it gets worse. I'm thinking about the six-year-old student I read about. And, the, you know, the six-year-old students were taught to bring about their, their favorite books for show and tell. Now, listen, they, they had show and tell back in my day. That was back in the days of Moses. <laughs> and I remember very clearly how excited we were to share the things that we brought to school. Well, here we have this little six-year-old student who brought the Bible because the Bible was the most important book to this child's family. And so he brought the Bible, and then he was told to take it home because it was against the law. You can't mix religion in the school system. Now, do you think that he's remembered that and will remember that for the rest of his life? I think so. I think so. This is a denial of Christian freedoms. I'm thinking about the graduating senior who had perfect grades, a 4.0 average, and yet she was denied the right to give an address to her graduation class. Why so? Well, because she had a sentence in her speech that gave credit to Jesus for bringing meaning into her life. Now, the religion of humanism, that's okay. Any other false religion, that's okay. But you've got to keep Jesus out of the picture. That bothers me. I also think about the church school run by a Christian preacher. And he was ordered to close it because the teachers in the school program did not have a state certification. Now, this is not religious certification or spiritual certification or biblical certification. This is secular state certification. If you don't have our certification, we close you down. That's basically what happened. Well, this was a preacher with a conscience. He felt that he was doing the will of God in setting up this church school. And after all, he just wanted to train his young people in Christian doctrine and Christian virtues. I mean, that's what we need, isn't it? And yet, the, uh, the, the, the society and the government officials came against them. In fact, during a prayer vigil for the school, the local sheriff and his deputy showed up and took them off to jail and then padlocked the church. You see, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the denial of Christian liberties. And I've got to tell you something. I think it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And I tell you what, the, the, the middle ground is going to get smaller. You will either stand for Jesus Christ or you won't. Will you join me? Will you stand for Jesus Christ in the midst of the onslaught? Come out on clean spirit. There we go. You know what's funny? As I was doing a message at one, one uh, church, and the whole PowerPoint thing went dead, and I said that, and it came back on. And everybody went, wow. Yeah. He has power over the spirit. <laughs> anyway, Christianity is also being attacked in the media. I'm sure that you've seen the big screen and the small screen and how Christians are often made to look like imbeciles. Very often on news programs, you will find Christians referred to as the, you know, religious right. And that is a term that implies that all of us Christians are intolerant, backwoods fanatics who don't use their brains. Meanwhile, the humanists are portrayed as these enlightened intellectuals. And of great relevance is the fact that humanism is indeed a religion. It is a religious system. In fact, back in 1961, it was declared a religion by the Supreme Court. And Julian Huxley predicted that humanism would be the ultimate religion of the world. Now, let me tell you why that bothers me. Since humanism permeates our public schools, and because humanism is a religion, it is fair to say that our public schools are institutions that indoctrinate our kids in false religion. Now, I want to be fair. We also have some great teachers that teach English and math and a lot of good stuff. I'm not belittling them or standing against them at all. But the fact is, we've got school systems that are teaching false religion. And guess who's paying for it? You and me. My dollars are being used in order to support a building that is built 
that has false religion within its walls. I don't know if that bothers you, but it bothers me. That's one of the reasons why we need to be involved in the political process and make sure that our voice is heard when decisions are made about school curriculum. Believe me, it can be done. Now, bottom line in what I've said so far is that Christianity indeed is in the crosshairs. And I again raise the question, will you stand with me? It is my prayer that you will. Now, what do humanists believe? What is this religion? What are some of the doctrines of this religion? Let's begin with the fact that it's anti-supernatural. In fact, one of the books that they've come out with is Humanist Manifesto 2, and it's one of the best summaries of, uh, of uh, this uh, doctrine of humanism. And listen to what they say. We find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of the supernatural. It is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of the survival and fulfillment of the human race. As non-theists, we begin with humans, not God, nature, not deity. Now, why is this beginning point so important? Well, if you begin on the premise of anti-supernaturalism, isn't that going to affect everything else? Isn't that going to set the stage for multiple denials of Christian doctrine? Well, it is. You see, the fact is, is this is foundational. Everything else proceeds from this. And keeping with that, there is no God, according to humanists. In fact, James Hitchcock says in his book, What is Secular Humanism?, Groups like the American Humanist Association are not humanists just in the sense that they have an interest in the humanities or that they value man over nature. In their self-definition, God does not exist. They promote a way of life that systematically excludes God and all religion in the traditional sense. Man, for better or worse, is on his own in the universe. He marks the highest point to which nature has yet evolved, and he must rely entirely on his own resources. And notice that phrase, way of life. You see, from the moment that they get up to the moment that they go to bed, humanism affects everything. The denial of God affects everything. It affects the, the words that they speak to other people. It affects their behavior. It affects their morality or lack thereof. It affects how they interact with the world. You see, their way of life is governed by the fact or by their claim that there is no God. Isaac Asimov is a good example, very popular writer and scientist, and he says this, Emotionally, I am an atheist. I don't have the evidence to prove that God doesn't exist, but I so strongly suspect he doesn't that I don't want to waste my time. Now, of course, Isaac Asimov is no longer an atheist. He is no longer an atheist. In fact, the moment that he died... He witnessed the utter collapse, the calamitous collapse, with utter clarity of humanistic atheism. And I suspect he wished he had taken more time. In any event, he goes on to say, The universe can be explained by evidence obtained from the universe alone. No supernatural agency need be called upon. In other words, evolution explains where we all came from. Now, of course, Carl Sagan is another individual that's already been mentioned in this conference. Carl Sagan uh, actually came out with a TV series, which was on PBS, and followed up with a book by the same name. And he said that the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. Where do you think he stole that phrase, by the way? At least part of it. Sounds kind of like the Christian doxology, doesn't it? It talks about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, who is and whoever was and whoever will be. It's almost like he's making the universe out to be God. But he indicates that there's no deity with whom we need to concern ourselves. Now, of course, Carl Sagan is no longer an atheist. You see, the moment that he died, he witnessed with utter clarity the calamitous collapse of humanistic atheism. And by the way, you know, it's a tragic thing, isn't it? I mean, God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, neither do I. God doesn't desire any to perish. But people have chosen the false religion of humanism. And I must tell you that if you go into eternity believing that religion, you go into a crisis eternity that lasts forever, you see. And that, that is a horrible destiny. Uh, even our kids are taught that there is no creator. Humanist Chris Brockman wrote a book called What About Gods? And I want you to listen to this. We no longer need gods to explain how things happen. By careful thinking, measuring, and testing, we have discovered many of the real causes of things. And we're discovering more all the time. 
We call this thinking. Now, what's the implication there? Well, the implication is that you and I don't think. Those creationists, those guys are a bunch of nincompoops. They don't use their brains. They check their brains at the door. They're holding on to old superstitions. But we think. Now we know the real cause of things. And the real cause of things is humanistic evolution. Of course, the philosophy behind all of it is naturalism, which says that all phenomena in the world can be explained in terms of natural causes and laws. Uh, Listen to how one modern science textbook puts it. Living creatures on earth are a direct product of the earth. There is every reason to believe that living things owe their origin entirely to certain physical and chemical properties of the ancient earth. Nothing supernatural appears to be involved. Only time and natural physical and chemical laws operating within the peculiarly suitable environment. So naturalism explains everything. Furthermore, there is no divine purpose for humanity. Listen to these words from the Humanist Manifesto 2. We can discover no divine purpose or providence for the human species. While there is much that we do not know, humans are responsible for what we are or will become. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. We are all alone in this great big universe. No ultimate purpose whatsoever. And in keeping with this, Paul Kurtz, who is a very famous humanist, who wrote a book called uh, Forbidden Fruit, The Ethics of Humanism, put it this way. And I want you to notice the terms, the derogatory terms that he uses to describe the Christian belief. The theist world is only a dream world. It is a feeble escape into a future that will never come. And then he goes on. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. They distract humans from present concerns, from self-actualization, and from rectifying social injustices. There is no credible evidence that life survives the death of the body. We continue to exist in our progeny and in the way that our lives have influenced others in our culture. Now, notice how this concern about eternal damnation is said to interfere with self-actualization. I almost find that comical. Yeah, you know the idea that there is a judge before before whom we must appear in the afterlife to give an account for our actions. Yeah, that might interfere a little bit with your present sinful lifestyle. You know, that's really what he's saying there. It's all about relativistic ethics. In terms of ethics, they affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. I was over in London, you know, and I rode a lot of those double-decker buses, and look at this picture. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. You see? It's kind of interesting because I was over in London when the bombs went off there, and one of those buses got blown to smithereens. Now, I don't know if that billboard was on that bus, It makes me wonder, makes me wonder. Bottom line, Christianity and humanism are diametrically different from each other. In terms of source, Christianity is based on the Bible, whereas secular humanism is based upon humanist manifesto 1, 2, and 3. In terms of theology, Christianity teaches theism, the idea of a personal creator God, whereas secular humanism believes in atheism. In terms of philosophy, Christianity holds to supernaturalism, The idea that there's a supernatural God who can do miracles and intervene in a miraculous way in our lives. Whereas secular humanism believes in naturalism. The idea that nature accounts for everything in our universe. In terms of ethics, Christianity believes in moral absolutes. In other words, ethics that are true for all people and in all ages. Whereas in terms of secular humanism, they believe in moral relativism. You know, uh, humanistic ethics basically says you can have your ethics and I can have mine. What works for you is fine. What works for me is fine. We are a law unto ourselves, basically, in this system of thought. In terms of biology, Christianity teaches creationism, whereas in secular humanism, we find evolution. In Christianity, the modus operandi is faith and reason. Yes, we have faith in the Bible, but God gave us reason to read it. Come let us reason, God says. Whereas in in secular humanism, They say that they are only interested in human rationalization. And by the way, is that true? Is it only human rationalization? I don't think so. In fact, I think that evolution and naturalism involves a whole lot more faith. 
That's why one of my good friends, Norman Geisler, wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. <laughs> see. So whether they want to admit it or not, they do have a faith system, and there's a lot more evidence that supports our viewpoint than their viewpoint. You see, our faith has evidence to support it. But as we'll see today, their faith does not. And then in terms of education, Christianity is value-based, whereas secular humanism is value-less. Now, how can we respond to the humanist challenge? How can we respond to atheism? Well, Dave, I, I didn't tell you this, but my session's going to go four hours in order to cover all of this. <laughs> no, my wife, Carrie, said, Ron, get them out on time. So we're going to get out on time today. But let me share some highlights with you. First of all, I want to let you know that humanism is nothing new. It is nothing new. In fact, there are seeds of humanism even back in biblical times. Now, let me clarify. It is true that the religion of humanism with Humanist Manifesto 1, 2, and 3, that's fairly recent. But in terms of the seeds of humanism, it goes way back to biblical times. For example, in Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5, we read, You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, who said that? That's right. Satan through the serpent said that. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Where do you think humanism came from? Satan. Let me tell you something, my friends. It is my belief that Satan is a master marketer. He is the one behind all of the false religions and cults, and his goal is to draw people away from the Christ of Scripture. Now, he's got different religions that appeal to different demographics in our society. For example, if you'd like to become a God ruling your own planet, <coughs> he's got Mormonism for you. If you're one of those people who likes to declare your reality, and by positive thinking, you can call your world into being, well, maybe the new thought movement is for you. That's with the law of attraction. Uh, or if you're uh, the type of person who would uh, like to do away with death and, and disease and suffering and that kind of stuff, well, Christian science is your ticket. You see, Satan has come up with all kinds of counterfeits in order to draw different parts of our society away from Jesus Christ. Now, humanism is one of his masterpieces. You see, it's one of the ones that has broad mass appeal. And for that reason, we need to be aware of it as Christians. We continue. Genesis 11:4. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves. You see, that's the humanistic tendency towards self-exaltation. This idea that we can become our own God. Judges 21:25. every man did what was right in his own eyes. Moral relativism. You see, we see that even back in biblical times. Likewise, Isaiah 5, 20 and 21, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And you know, instead of black and white categories, everything merges into a gray zone. Again, that's moral relativism, this idea that there's nothing absolute that we need to pay attention to. And then, of course, there's the warning from the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2.8, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Now, a second point I want to make you aware of is that Scripture actually prophesies end times humanism. Now, would you agree with me that we're living in the end times? I think that we are, and, and one of the things that we're seeing is this rise in humanism. And I'm thinking of 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. Realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Doesn't sound too good, does it? Doesn't sound too good at all. But I want you to notice lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure. Uh, lovers of self is another way of describing humanism. Lovers of money.